President of the Conference, Uktrona Kogola, Vice Presidents, Director General Ahalche, Excellency, distinguished guests. <clears throat> I am very deeply honoured to be here to join and to speak to so many distinguished delegates from so many nations. And so may I begin then by thanking the Director General of the International Labour Organization, Guy Ryder, for his generous and indeed gracious comments and for his indeed invitation to address this plenary sitting of the 107th session of the International Labour Conference. I'm very conscious that I am addressing the longest established and one of the most important institutions in the conduct of international relations. One that gives voice not only to governments, but to the representatives of workers and employers. One that attempts a partnership one that was born of the collision of empires, the collapse in human solidarity that we know now as the First World War. This year, of course, on November the 11th, many of the nations of the world shall commemorate the conclusion of that war. And it is my hope that they will do so, not as a celebration of militarism or as a valorization of martial spirit, but as a recognition of the wasted promise and potential of the millions who lost their lives during that conflict, of the lasting damage to further millions who were wounded and maimed, and of the countless others who suffered mental anguish as a consequence of bearing witness to the horrors of war. Is it not one of the great tragedies, I ask, in human history, that such a global consciousness as might privilege cooperation rather than aggression, rather than conflict, domination, exploitation, or insatiable accumulation, has not emerged, established itself, sustained itself, but rather in so many places in modern times has been dismissed, devalued, even abandoned. And then of all the institutions established by the international community in the wake of that cataclysm that was the First World War, only one has endured to this day. The International Labour Organization, with its affiliation of 189 peoples. That it has done so is testament to the moral vision and indomitable hope that is contained within the preamble to the constitution of the organization. And it reads, universal and lasting peace can be established only if it is based upon social justice. In our present circumstances, 99 years later, after that constitution was first proclaimed, that spirit of idealism invoked and of vital moral purpose is surely more urgently required than ever. Today, as we reflect on the adoption of employment and decent work for peace and resilience recommendations by this conference last year, let us seek to draw more from those foundational moments in the organization's history, such as in 1919, and again in 1944, when the community of nations was, for a moment, resolved to build from those ashes of war, a war that had brought human behavior to the nadir of cruelty and abuse of the most basic human instincts, a more it sought, a more just and equal economic order, one built on the dignity of labor, one in which all those involved in economic and social organization recognized their duties and possibilities for the common good. There was then a certain urgency, even desperation, to move to a new place in human experience. The precursor to the recommendation of 2017, the employment transition from war to peace recommendation, was, let us recall, adopted on the 12th of May 1944, only two days after the Declaration of Philadelphia. And to read it today is a reminder of the enormous challenges 
that were then confronting a world which sought to meet the needs of a great variety of diverse populations. Refugees fleeing persecution, invading armies, demobilizing soldiers, workers with disabilities, and of course women who had entered the industrial labor force in huge numbers. The Declaration of 1944 has an engaged intellectual and moral background that ensured it would not simply descend to the level of a set of rhetorical flourishes to be recalled in the future time. It was followed, implemented, by a defined role for the state. And as to the accepted role of the market, recalling the devastating impact of wild speculative tendencies in 1929, there was an acceptance of the need for regulatory mechanisms if social cohesion was to be achieved. In so many states and societies, if it was the case that the wars had thrown people against each other, the welfare state, with its project of shared citizenship, was bringing them together, seeking to lift them off the social floor, offering some guarantee as to the basic dignity in citizenship, encouraging political participation as a space for discourse as to options for the connection between economy and society. More than 60 years later, the task before us of building and sustaining a peace based on social justice is daunting, just as daunting, perhaps even more so as the task of the 26th session of this conference faced in 1944. For we in these first decades of the 21st century again live in a world marked by war and the rumor of war, preparations for war, that will absorb not only the muscle and sinew of our physical labor, but the creativity of our intellectual labor. War built on fear of the other, ignorance and impatience as to the different forms of economy presented and too often perceived as inevitable, even if they are sustained by continuing injustice and deepening inequality. The burdens of war, Famine, atrocity, starvation, displacement, forced migrations now fall ever more upon those least able to bear them, upon women, children, and older people. We too, in the new conditions of our time, must take stock of the challenges we face and our capacity for response. Are we to allow a role for the state as partner in constructing an emancipatory, more inclusive citizenship. Given in particular the challenges of climate change and sustainability issues, can we bring an institutional and policy architecture into being, one that not only envisages partnership, but allows for an entrepreneurial state and entrepreneurial state institutions, as has been suggested by intellectuals such as Professor Mariana Masacato of the University of London? What serious scholarship supports the view, for example, that a mere adjustment of our present practices will suffice for any of these challenges? Inequalities in wealth, income, and power, both a cause and consequence of war, are widening, widening both between and within nations, excluding hundreds of millions on the basis of the intersecting lines of class, nationality, ethnicity, and gender. The unprecedented accumulation of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere the legacy of two centuries of industrial civilization now threatens a planet most vulnerable to and as yet unprepared for the catastrophic consequences of climate change, with all the devastating implications for the displacement of people, involuntary migration, the degradation of the environment, and the eruption of new conflicts over diminishing natural resources. Yet at the very same time, as we hold as an international community, within our collective grasp, the capacity to organize our labor within a framework of irreducible and indivisible dignity of work, 
whether by hand or brain, and win our resources, whether material or intellectual, to abolish all forms of human poverty exist, and could ensure that, in the words of the Declaration of Philadelphia, all human beings, irrespective of race, creed, or sex, have the right to pursue both their material well-being and their spiritual development in conditions of freedom and dignity, of economic security, and equal opportunity. And in terms of those aims, are we not drifting towards failure? In affirming that principle I have just quoted, we, the members of the International Labour Organization, accept a moral, political, social and economic responsibility, not only to the peoples of our own nations, but to the peoples of other nations, and indeed, may I emphasize, to future generations as well. For there can be no social justice that is not unlimited, no peace that is not universal, and no solidarity that is not open to all. Two months ago, I addressed the United Nations General Assembly as part of the high-level meeting on peace building and sustaining peace. It is very clear that Secretary General Guterres is seeking to meet the aspirations outlined in the resolutions on peace building adopted by the Security Council and the General Assembly in 2016. The report prepared by the Secretary General on foot of those resolutions has outlined an ambitious plan of action for the United Nations and its agencies. It presents a vision of and relies upon the member states and agencies of the United Nations working cohesively across the pillars of peace and security, human rights and development, to address the root causes of conflict so that we are not merely responding. Yet the activities of the United Nations have been fractured by the actions of the most powerful. If our predecessors of 1944 saw how global accountability in international capital flows was necessary, which led to the establishment of the Bretton Woods institutions, we in our time have failed to secure even a space for the discourse of accountability. Future history will contrast the moral urgency of the discourse of 1944 with the contemporary spectacle that is Davos, and they will draw the inevitable moral conclusions. Ever since its inception, the International Labour Organization has been dedicated to the proposition that peace can only be built and can only be sustained when it is founded on a just and equal economic order, when capable of meeting the needs and aspirations of all people in their diversity. In the words of the Declaration of Philadelphia, which still ring through the decades to us today, Poverty anywhere constitutes a danger to prosperity everywhere. The International Labour Organization draws for its ideas, for its inspiration and for its decisions upon both states themselves and upon workers and employers, upon, in short, nearly 100 years of social dialogue that has been seeking consensus and partnership. By placing decent work and social justice at the very heart of its approach, the International Labour Organization secured not only the mandate but achieved the credibility, and it still retains the potential to be one of the international organizations best equipped to assist nations and their peoples to build resilience and to prevent conflict. Ireland, as the Secretary General has said, has been a part of the transformative work of the International Labour Organization since 1923. It was the first international organization that our newly independent state joined, and one of four, one of four nations most distinguished international, sorry, I beg your pardon, one of our most distinguished international civil servants in those early years of our independence, Edward Phelan, devoted his career to this organization and was instrumental in the drafting and preparation of the Declaration of Philadelphia. As Director General, he championed and pursued the spirit of diplomacy and dialogue that has and continues to be so characteristic of this organization. A diplomacy of the common good, a diplomacy informed by deliberation, 
courtesy and respect, rather than any cynical and narrow diplomacy of transaction, derived from an inimiserated and certainly what is at best insufficient, narrow theory of interest of threatened disadvantage. Ireland, the country I represent, knows from our own peace process to which you have referred that a diplomacy of mutual respect, of plural and shared narratives, can succeed if it is practiced with consistency and transparency of purpose. The Northern Ireland Peace Agreement of 20 years ago, signed on Good Friday, represents and remains a profound achievement, one that is underpinned by many of the guiding principles recognised by the recommendation of 2017. The importance of reconciliation, the need for international solidarity, the necessity to combat discrimination in all its forms, the imperative of recognising fundamental human rights, whether they be civil, social, economic, cultural or political. Support for decent work, for social protection and for fundamental rights may not remove or supplant what are, as in the case of Northern Ireland, of course, deeply held views regarding the constitutional arrangements under which people wish to live, or the legitimate national aspirations that many of the peoples of the world hold. Yet the peace agreement in Northern Ireland does demonstrate that when all parties to a conflict respect and commit to those fundamental principles of decent work, security to participate in the public world, security from fear of insufficient provision in health, housing or education. It is possible to create a shared space capable of accommodating different aspirations, one in which it is possible to imagine a shared future of hope and possibility. It is also important to emphasise that our peace could not have been achieved nor could it have been sustained without the persistent and courageous activism of civic organisations campaigning for a more equal and peaceful society. The trade union movement on an all-Ireland basis has been the greatest, most consistent, most courageous opponent of sectarianism. Many of those campaigns against sectarianism for the welfare of citizens and workers were led by women of Ireland, North and South. Their campaigns demonstrates that gender equality can never be simply residual to peace building. It must be placed at its very heart. One of the most critical components of the peace process and of the process of peace building in Northern Ireland has of course also been the sustained financing for peace undertaken by the governments of Ireland and of the United Kingdom and through the European Union programme for peace and reconciliation. Indeed, European Union investment is of such material and symbolic importance that it is embedded within the peace agreement itself through a special European Union programmes body which coordinates funding for Northern Ireland, the border region and west of Scotland. That funding is directed towards the training of young people, creating shared spaces for education and meeting the needs of victims of conflict. These initiatives were and are appropriate in a very specific regional context, one which is not necessarily reproducible in all other parts of our planet, and indeed one which is subject to some uncertainty at present. And so may I welcome the, as President of Ireland, the commitment of the International Labour Organisation to its programme on jobs for peace and resilience. Expanding economic opportunities, ensuring the recognition of fundamental social and economic rights, advocating advancing and achieving decent work, facilitating social dialogue between workers, employers and civic organisations are critical components of recovery from conflict and the prevention of any return to war. I therefore welcome the ambition 
to place the International Labour Organization at the centre of our efforts to create a new global architecture for sustaining peace, for sufficient and effective investment in rights-based peace-building programmes will not only save lives, but will offer to the peoples of the world all of the possibilities for development and human flourishing that peace can bring. This will be necessary if we are to accomplish the goals of that most remarkable declaration of shared global solidarity, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, to which we committed ourselves in New York two and a half years ago. The message of the International Labour Organization must be brought to the attention of the world how much better it would be if the necessary elements of what constituted social cohesion was the discourse that prevailed on the streets of the world, rather than the excluded being abandoned to become the prey of xenophobes, homophobes and racists. In our present circumstances, none of what I've described will be easy. The diplomacy of the global common good exemplified by this organisation, is giving way to a recurrence of the kind of diplomacy practised in the worst moments of the past century, one characterised by narrow self-interest, and at its worst a disdain for those hard-fought and hard-won basic rights that stand at the centre of international law, whether it is encoded in the Refugee Convention, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, or indeed with the conventions governing the most foundational rights at work. And when I spoke to the United Nations General Assembly two months ago, I said that so many of our global citizens, and particularly the young of the world, are so often appalled by the suggestion that where the United Nations is concerned, what is normative, what is normative or based on values can be tolerated for the General Assembly, but that the strut of the powerful and the wielders of power must prevail in the Security Council. What is normative is now regarded as something that, as it were, can be parked on a siding, and thus a false dichotomy between what is normative theoretically and valuable and what can be empirically validated simply becomes the work of lazy commentary. May I suggest today this organisation itself has too often and for too many years been treated as if it were simply normative, as some kind of advisory body or some echo of conscience to be acknowledged and then disregarded. I say this not to diminish in any way the work that has been carried out by the International Labour Organisation. Indeed, the intellectual agenda forged by this organisation through rigorous and critically engaged intellectual work of its research department has been instrumental in equipping eight nations and people to understand the far-reaching effects of the liberalisation of finance and trade, unemployment rights, labour markets, the new international division of labour, and on the increasing power and reach of global value chain controlled and organised by transnational corporations that are often offering no transparency to the global community. However, I would challenge some of our member governments to show evidence that they took as a primary source the commitments made to the Constitution and Conventions of the International Labour Organisation or indeed any account of the United Nations commissions for the different regions of the world reports that are evidence-based, rigorous, relevant in their policy recommendations, which are rarely quoted by governments or government agencies. For too many governments, ideologically predictable consultancy bodies, not research-based, rarely refereed by peers, are far more comfortable reading. This conference has itself been the site of so many important interventions as to rights. The Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work, adopted by the 86th session, 
has provided a shared and universal framework in which to achieve dignity at work in a world in which regions and nations are experiencing all of the differential effects of globalisation, expansion and recession, development and underdevelopment. The Declaration on Social Justice for a Fair Globalisation, adopted in 2008, advocated an alternative to the simple deregulatory nostrums of the now discredited Washington Consensus, based on a vision of decent work for all, one that promised a globalisation of the social floor rather than the social ceiling. A globalisation based on employment, social protection, social dialogue and rights at work. This should amount to more than one voice from a discordant chorus of silos. Too often the international financial institutions, the World Trade Organisation and member states have turned their face away from the fundamental principles promulgated by the International Labour Organisation and have not merely been seduced, but have become proponents of a theory of government and governance, now popularly known as neoliberalism, which is really an ideology that need not declare its name. Its policy agenda is now familiar to us all. The removal of constraints on growth, use and flow of capital and wealth, the privatisation of state assets, sharp reductions in the taxation of capital, the curtainment of social protection, neglect of the public realm, the dismantlement of collective bargaining in so many states, and in its most extreme variant, even the very concept of social dialogue itself. It is based on, draws on, stands for, the radical experience of an exclusive private existence that is perceived as being under threat from any concept of the public world, the citizens of a shared public space, publics that might be served by democratically accountable institutions. I believe that all these difficulties can be overcome. For let us recall that in the difficult climate of the Cold War, this conference struggled understandably to reach a consensus. Though every national delegation, whether representing the state, workers or employers, share the same fate in that immortal precept, universal and lasting peace can be established only if it is based upon social justice. And thus they disagreed, often profoundly, on the manner in which social justice was to be expressed. And their arguments were legitimate. It was to be expected that what were then termed the East and the West would offer alternative visions, based on both their strengths and their erroneous, even violent assumptions. It was also to be expected that the hells of the newly free nations of the world would bring their own conception of social justice and of the role of labour. For all that debate and disputation, what was never in doubt was the shared conception that social justice was to be the organising principle upon which the actions of the organisation and its members would be based. And it was regarded as possible. Yet ever since the end of the Cold War, the very idea that social justice is an end of policy itself, whether in itself or the buttress upon which all peace, industrial peace, social peace, peace between nations, peace in its wider sense, rests, has come to be disputed and even dismissed by many, replaced by an ideology which sanctions poverty amidst plenty and private desire over public good, insatiable consumption over sustainability, unrestricted accumulation over diversity of competition, and the freedoms of the market over the rights and dignity of labour. Indeed, I was introduced to someone with an interest in philosophy, and if ever a concept was robbed of moral contact in philosophical terms in these decades, it was surely the concept of freedom itself. This conference and this organisation, along with other agencies of the United Nations, I know have often been lonely advocates for a much needed alternative vision of globalisation, particularly in an international environment where the self-assured and indeed often self-promoting voices 
at Davos and others, have at times resounded louder in the halls of power than any voice of labour, or indeed the voice of so many small and medium-sized business. The rigidity of these ideological positions, substitution for empirically testable theories, is, I think, giving ground, and surely that is to be welcomed. What I have described is now, albeit slowly, beginning to change. And may I commend Director General Ryder and the staff of the International Liberal Organization for their recent productive collaboration with some of the international financial institutions and the World Trade Organization. It is an indication not only of institutional success, but of a gradual and necessary shift in the intellectual climate. Agencies which once advocated with more than, a more than a tinge of hubris and intoning the mantra of inevitability, characteristic neoliberal policies such as the universal liberalisation of capital flows and the deregulation and creation of financial markets have now begun to question what were once their sacrosanct and unchanging policy prescriptions. Such institutions, when confronted, with the prospects of the consequences of a lost social cohesion, now speak of the need for inclusive growth and are policies which can address the vast inequalities that exist within and between countries in terms of income, opportunity and wealth. Recognising, however late, that more equal societies are healthier societies. But they also realise that the space of the lost mediating institutions is a dangerous space in which to be, one without a future for jobs or employment. And frankly, the roar from the street without unmediating inst with mediating institutions will be threatened. Indeed, the recent arrival of behavioural economics perspectives in international reports may herald more than merely a lifeboat launched from a sinking ship. It may be a tentative recognition that restoring social cohesion is the alternative to facing the inchoate anger of the global street. More importantly, after many years of critique from within and without, those organisations are now beginning to question some of their long-held a priori assumptions. I have been most impressed by the capacity of the International Labour Organisation to place some of the most basic questions of distribution of income on the agenda. Its recent work on the relative proportion of gross national income accruing to labour and capital in current conditions has been a valuable contribution to a responsible discourse. That work, carried out in concert with the International Monetary Fund, showed that the labour share of gross national income has been declining in most countries since 1980. When we speak of labour, and of the fruits of labour, and of the distribution and gains and losses of globalisation, the question that work poses is a fundamental question. For if the overwhelming gains of globalisation accrue only to the few and are predicted to continue for the few, and the losses imposed and pushed down upon the many, really can we envision a peaceful world? So I want to congratulate those who are working on the theme of the future of work. I am most acutely aware of the danger of confining our vision of the economy to that which is measured by conventional methods of national income, output and expenditure. In doing so, we lose sight of so much of that which is of substance in the world of work. Envisioning the future of work is inescapably an interdisciplinary exercise. Our citizens, all of us, have related, relate and will relate to work from different perspectives. And all of these differences are important. Work as a human activity is the experience of living in the fullness of lived experience within a society and culture. It is irredu irreducibly social, inextricably linked to citizenship. Yet much of the essential work carried out by women, caring for the family, the sick and the elderly, sustaining and educating the household, is not measured if it is not carried out in the marketplace. 
Development economists such as, es as Esther Bosera have reminded us that this so often amounts to nothing less than masking a double workload, as women are so often condemned to perpetual work, work that is not emancipatory as I've described it, but often long, unremitting and exhausting. At work itself, many working in Europe are reporting levels of stress at work, and there are meaningful differences between countries that are associated with levels of social protection, provision for inclusion, and adequacy of public provision in the public world in relation to these reported levels of stress. On every continent, too many women are living in precarious conditions with limited economic power are most vulnerable in relation to household provision, to rapid movement of commodity prices, which are such a structural feature in the present era of globalization. Within the internationally traded economy, there is scant consideration for such women. Transnational corporations are permitted to transfer risk down through the global supply and value chains, often to those who can bear it least, whether it be farm or factory workers, thus often compounding the gender, pay gap, the gender pay gap even further. So, may I warmly commend the report on the Women at Work initiative presented to this conference by the Director General and its proposals for the reform as to metrics, to establish new forms of statistical measurement that will have the capacity to value the totality of women's work, to ensure, for example, that the growing care economy is grounded on decent work, and the introduction of measures to strengthen women's control over their own work time. Above all, on a day in which we speak of conflict and peace building, I would like to commend the commitment for an end, not in a decade's time, but now to violence and harassment against women in the workplace. These daily acts of aggression against women are a global outrage and they know no national bar barriers. At times they occur within the context of slavery, indentured labour or physical abduction and abuse. And this must be ended and it requires a global response, one which begins in our own workplaces whether in the agencies of the United Nations, in our public administrations, in factories, on farms, or in offices. And let us say it clearly and unequivocally, no invocation of culture must be given the credence it seeks to block or impede any basic human right. President, Your Excellency, distinguished guests, when he received the Nobel Prize for in 1974, one of my fellow countrymen, Sean McBride, spoke of the imperatives of survival in the 20th century, which he believed could only be met through the fulfilment of the United Nations Charter, nothing less than a universal peace. On our planet now bearing the ravages of climate change, the imperatives of survival will rest on our capacity to fulfill the promise of the constitution of this organization and meet the contemporary demands of, so, of global social justice. We will need to move the discourse on work beyond the atmosphere of a labor market. Work has to be discussed within a model of human capacity, of human flourishing within a participatory society as inextricably linked to citizenship. This challenge, as I suggest, and I suggest it with not a little sadness and with respect, a rather collapsed contemporary scholarship in economic theory and policy. We do so need an adequate reinvigorated social economics that can integrate with ecological realities and an inclusive global ethics. And we need an intellectual integrity that will privilege, make possible, pluralist scholarship and thinking. So much of that work is being undertaken by this organization, whether through the Global Commission on the Future of Work or the intellectual labor that it has provoked. Given the diversity of our human history, of our philosophical, ethical and faith traditions, and of our respective economies and societies, there never has been nor will there ever be 
a single definition of work or of labour, nor a single expression of work as a human experience. And it would be a fallacy to simply assume that our contemporary institutions, institutions that we have the power to shape, will remain unchanged as labour-saving technology owned and applied by the few shapes the lives of the many. I so welcome the work of those intellectuals who are engaging with these challenges of change. For example, in a paper published in 2016 by the ILO, Professor Dominique Mehta has proposed that rather than accepting any inevitable future, be it utopian, benign or malign as to the impact of technology, public policy could be a choice between options, be directed to ensure an ecological conversion in conditions that protects and even expands decent work. De Maida's paper represents the type of bold, ambitious, ethically informed thinking that we require at this time in this century, one that places work, as with all human activities, within the context of global citizenship itself, linking economy, work, citizenship and adequacy of ecological response. We must be more than hopeful. We must be committed to action. For after all, through those two vital moral achievements of the diplomacy of the common good, the Paris Climate Accord and the Sustainable Development Goals, we now have vehicles through which we can focus, organise and measure our efforts in a way that will enable us to meet the challenges of our century and build a lasting peace, decent work, gender equality and climate ju justice. They are after all at its very core. Secretary General has proposed bold and necessary reforms to the United Nations system to prepare all its constituent parts for those enormous tasks ahead, the accomplishment of which will require the best of our courage and our energy, tasks to which this organisation will be central. The United Nations needs all of our support now. It is our United Nations, and in too many of its parts it is under siege from within and without. In these times, the need for the International Labour Organization and the rights to which it is devoted has never been more urgent. If we are to achieve the necessary decarbonisation of our economies, if we are to rise to the actions demanded of us, we must rediscover the moral courage equivalent to that which this conference displayed in 1944, when it declared that peace could only rest upon international policies and measures which promote the attainment of social justice. This will require a convergence of vision between the institutions of the United States, the United Nations, a unified voice from the silos, the member states, organizations of regional cooperation, and if we are to be serious, the Bretton Woods institutions. There are warning signs, surely, of which we should take note. The surge in world conflict we have witnessed, and for which so many peoples have suffered in the last two decades alone, has occurred at the very moment we are as a planet, reaching the highest point of the internationalization of capital and goods and markets in our history. The great conflagration of the First World War that consumed the generation of the young and the old and which gave birth to this organization broke out during the previous high point of globalization. Despite the warnings that have issued from this conference in previous times, a social globalization, a globalization of ethical interdependence, has in too many places been issued to make way for an uncritical pursuit of a globalization of trade and of finance a single version of globalization, one that has abused its authority to sustain an ignorance of those forms of intellectual inquiry sourced in humanism. This hegemony, and I'm finishing this, this hegemony of intellectual thought is not an accidental phenomenon. It has been in gestation since the first reflections of von Mises and von Hayek just four years after that meeting of, 1840, of 1944. It has colonized universities and places of learning, bonded foundations and thought centers serve this hegemony as they eschew or devalue even pluralist scholarship. So let us heed once again the lesson of a century ago.
that peace does not simply rest on common markets, come as residue or facilitating condition to the markets, but upon a global solidarity, intellectually powerful, built on adequate literacy of the economic and the fiscal, one dedicated to the realisation of social justice and equality for all our peoples, equality in all its forms, gender equality, economic equality, social equality, equality of opportunity. That is how peace will be built and maintained in this century, a century that must, in new and ever-changing conditions, craft the experience of work within a sustainable, ethical, global citizenship. May we succeed together. Babanat, thank you very much.